ancient as the Greeks as it may be, it seems that archive is having its turn as one of those words like the body, visuality, hybridity, the aesthetic, and so on, that surge suddenly and surprisingly into fashion as the must-have accessory of the moment. And for a time, they then become like brand names, the focus of intense loyalties, and the object of impassioned exchanges, understandable only to those who belong to the code. This struck me again recently as I was entering an exhibition of contemporary photography, video, and performance at the Guggenheim Museum. Is that going to work? Right. So this uh, brand name like quality to words like the archive as they zoom into fashion struck me again recently as I was entering an exhibition of contemporary vi photography, video and performance at the Guggenheim Museum and found myself following the crowd straight into a section labeled Appropriation and the Archive, one of five formal and conceptual threads around which the curators had organized their selection from what has become by now an institutionalized canon of recent work. Starting with Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol, the opening wall panel told us, an archiving impulse has revolutionized art, paving the way for a conceptually driven use of photography, intent on exploring possibilities encompassed by the idea that an artwork can serve as an archive. Drawing its terms from a 2004 essay by Hal Foster, the curatorial language here is characteristically inert drained of anything that might constitute a threat to the institution. It's a striking reversal from an earlier time when Alan Sekula could write of the shadowy presence of the archive in the countless files, folders, drawers, and shelves, where in the years between 1880 and 1910, the archive became the dominant institutional basis for photographic meaning. For Sekula and for some others at the end of the 1970s, the archival mode was a political apparatus, inseparable from the rationalization of information, the control of bodies, and the relegation of the photographic operator to the status of a detail worker. Something has clearly been lost then in the accommodation to the museum and the absorption of the impetus of theory into the servicing of a hardly varied canon. This may be reason enough to try to go back to recover something of the edge and point of the original arguments 30 years ago. But the issue of the archive is also as pressing now as it ever was in the 19th century. So before we try to distance its effects as endlessly fraught by melancholy and the uncanny, Perhaps we should try to encounter its machinery in the full force and confidence of its operation as an apparatus of rationalization and social management. An instrumental machine that, in grasping and appropriating photography, subsumed the camera and its peripherals, radically complicating our sense of what can actually be said to constitute the photographic apparatus. Now this process began early, and not in some airless basement room of a Department of State, as one might suspect. It was always more domesticated than that. So let us start in the drawing room, or perhaps in a gentleman's library, a gentleman like Oliver Wendell Holmes. It was in 1859, 
that the American physician, essayist, poet, and inventor published the first of his unrestrained paeans to the stereoscope and the stereograph. Though at the time, he may not perhaps have entirely intended his readers to think he'd given himself over to hyperbole, not even in that Baudrillardian moment when he declared the world of mere matter to have been overwhelmed, stripped of its forms, and rendered redundant by the triumph of stereoscopic simulation. Now, whatever we make of this, as an avid collector of stereo cards, as the inventor of a popular handheld viewer that you see here, and as a vocal advocate of stereographic libraries, Holmes also knew, with rather more certainty, that those little card mounts with their two almost identical images threatened to overwhelm in an entirely different and more mundane way. Just a few years earlier, between 1854 and 1856, following the successful showing of stereographs at London's Great Exhibition, the London Stereoscopic Company alone had produced and sold half a million stereoscopic images from an inventory that by 1859 listed 100,000 different stereoscopic views. After 1857, as card-mounted paper prints of stereoscopic wet plate negatives began to prevail, these lucrative parlor novelties were mass-produced in their millions, reaching a peak of popularity in the early decades of the 20th century through the astute marketing strategies of such corporations as the Keystone View Company and Underwood and Underwood. Now Holmes took the inexhaustible exactness and what he called the infinite charm of stereographic images to be key to their hold on viewers. Yet we may ask if this was enough. Clearly, publishers' warehouses would have been overwhelmed and their retail outlets reduced to unprofitable chaos if the technology of the binocular camera had not also been harnessed to another more modest yet equally exacting technology, the comparatively understudied machinery of the cabinet with its labeled drawers, card dividers, titles, captions, and that felicitous accompaniment, the catalog, whose subject headings, subheadings, and thematic sets served to organize both the logic of production and the drives of consumer desire. If Holmes saw the shock value of the stereograph as an appearance of reality which cheats the senses with its seeming truth, he himself knew that the photograph's mechanism of capture could not operate so irresistibly if not embedded in the entirely non-mimetic machinery of the catalog and the file. As early as 1859, Holmes foresaw that the consequence of the proliferation of stereographic images will soon be such enormous collections of forms that they will have to be classified and arranged in vast libraries as books are now. This moved Holmes to call for the creation of a comprehensive and systematic stereographic library. Indeed, for a whole chain of libraries at what Holmes called the city, the national, and the imperial levels. Yet even in the rather less grandiose spaces of the drawing room, church hall, and school room, where the stereograph made its more certain home, some sort of technology of storage and retrieval and some sort of system of classification and arrangement were equally wanting. So it was that the more or less elaborate stereoscopic viewer came quite habitually to be found alongside another equally important item of furniture, providing a means of organizing and housing the collection, often in an order shaped by the sets and series of the manufacturer's catalog, which demanding completion as they did, continually reincited the consumer's desire 
while giving the profitable little commodities the aura of something more than mere entertainment. Even on this homely plane, therefore, the cabinet, case, and humble shoebox marked the semantic space in which the singularity of the view was inserted into a more complex representation of the world that in its aspirations at least offered a glimpse of a kind of topographical encyclopedia whose organization betrayed a whole geographical system. For as Rosalind Krauss has written, the file cabinet is very different as an object from the wall or the easel. It holds out the possibility of storing and cross-referencing bits of information and of collating them through the particular grid of a system of knowledge. Already then, we are dealing with something more than merely a means of coping with the problem of overaccumulation, though this remained the persistent challenge of the developing photographic economy. A trade card from the mid-1860s, advertising the Paris photographic studio of Xavier Merieux encapsulates this threat. The camera has, has become a production machine, spewing forth a stream of commodities in such a promise of profusion that the somewhat consternated operator seems like the sorcerer's apprentice to be in danger of being entirely submerged if, other, if the other cameras follow suit and the stream of commodities becomes a deluge. This danger was also felt by the architects of those great accumulations of instrumental images that began to be assembled in sporadic ways from the mid-1850s on, but at an accelerated pace after, 1850, after 1870. As Alphonse Pétillon, director of the Identification Bureau of the Paris Prefecture of Police, and inventor of the first scientific system for cataloging and retrieving photographic records protested in 1891. The collection of criminal portraits has already attained a size so considerable that it has become physically impossible to discover among them the likeness of an individual who has assumed a false name. It goes for nothing that in the past 10 years the Paris police have collected more than 100,000 photographs. Does the reader believe it practicable to compare successively each one of these with each one of the hundred individuals who are arrested daily in Paris? So if the professional criminal's mastery of disguises, false identities, alibis, and multiple biographies was to be broken, and if the early promise of photography as a means of detection was not to wither in the face of a massive and chaotic accumulation of images. What was needed, Bertillon argued, was a method of elimination, this is his words, a method of elimination analogous to that in use in botany and zoology. That is to say, one based on the characteristic elements of individuality. For such a system, the integration of precisely standardized photographs with systematized anthropometric measurements and a refined physiognomic vocabulary provided certainly the foundation, but the problem of classification was paramount. Only by inserting his individual signaletic cards into a statistically ground system of organization was Bertillon able to file 100,000 records in a comprehensive grid of file drawers from which records could be retrieved quickly and effectively with a minimum expenditure of labor. As Alan Sekula has argued, Bertillon was one of the first users of photographic documents to comprehend fully the fundamental problem of the archive, the problem of volume. It is indeed at this time that leading furniture companies such as Yorman, Erber, and um, Yeoman and Erber of Rochester, New York, began not only to produce Bertillon cabinets for criminal identification, 
but also to manufacture ledger systems, card record holders, business files, and library card catalogs, promoting their products through the publication of primers in business studies, such as that great classic, Modern Filing and How to File, a textbook on office system. So there's clearly a wider process of technological dissemination at play here, and its consequences are considerable. These consequences began to unfold, as in the very period in which mass-produced dry plates and accessible handheld cameras also became widely available, the archiving of photographs came to play a more and more central role in an expanding ray, array of disciplinary institutions and empirical disciplines, ranging from psychiatry and medicine to art history and military intelligence. If Bertillon had demonstrated the utility of his model for policing the mobile population of the modern city, then other disciplines too faced equally challenging problems in cataloging accumulations of photographs that threatened to overwhelm. Once again, the issue was not only one of storage and retrieval. The categorical system of the instrumental archive was also absolutely central to its knowledge effect. This indeed was the promise of the photographic archive. And while its realization seemed to be grounded on the technical refinement of strictly optical technologies, it was clear that the archiving lens only produced its disciplinary effects when integrated into a larger ensemble, a bureaucratic clerical system whose central artifact was indeed not primarily the camera, but rather the filing cabinet. Though it is baffling to us now, perhaps, what we encounter right into the early years of the 20th century is an overbrimming enthusiasm for this new information technology, the modern vertical file. Invented in 1892 and first displayed at the Chicago World's Fair the following year, the vertical file was still being hailed more than 20 years later as an instrument for organizing and handling archives, that is, and I quote, as near an approach to the ideal as can reasonably be expected. The, vote that I, the, the, the view that I quote is the view of H.D. Gower, L. Stanley Jest, and W. W. Topley, past and presiding officers of the Photographic Survey and Record of Surrey, and authors of the indispensable handbook to photographic record work, The Camera as Historian. For Gower, Jast, and Topley, while the meaning of the actual record photograph could be taken as read in little more than two pages and a single strategic plate, more than a third of their book's 260 pages demanded to be given over to the really engaging questions, the questions of storage. As in the case of Bertillon, what concerned Gower, Jast, and Topley was that as the number of photographic survey records grew, it was clearly impossible to handle them or to access their collective record without an expandable system of storage and without what they called a proper arrangement, by which they meant a systematic order. It was this that the modern vertical file made possible. Like the paradigm and Saussure's linguistics, the structure of the filing cabinet and the classificatory order it supported determined the system of substitutions and equivalences within which the photographic signs were dispersed. But as in the Saussurean model itself, the construction of meaning across this structure of differences could not but radically conflict with the notion of meaning as a fullness interior to the sign, a notion nowhere more firmly entrenched than in relation to the photograph. In the annals of the survey and record, 
The photographs function as history, turned not just on the fixed yet empty indexical relation to the singularity of a temporal moment, but on its relation to the machinery of the archive. As a result, the primacy of the camera and the indexical realism of the print were unwittingly but effectively displaced, suggesting that Gower, Jast, and Topley, formalists in their hearts after all, might better have titled their work The Filing Cabinet as Historian. We seem then to have entered the world of Borges's Library of Babel, structured like the system of a language in its infinite extension. But it was only in the bureaucratic imagination that the modern vertical file of the survey and record could be seen as functioning like an ideal language system. In itself, that system could never escape its structural incompletion, marked by the fatal shafts of emptiness that pierce the architecture of Borges's library. But beyond this, we've also learned from Foucault that the space of the file is the space of a disciplinary machine, an apparatus for individuation and categorization, an instrument for regulating bodies, territories, and knowledge, rendering them the object of technocratic adjudication. We would do well, then, not to forget this, though not in order to embrace the fantasy of an inexorable archival machine, beloved as this may be to conspirers and conspiracy theorists alike. In the first place, as Robin Kelsey has amply shown in relation to the place of Timothy O'Sullivan's photographs in the files and reports of Wheeler's geographic exploration and survey west of the 100th meridian. The archive may be ruled by an internal logic that governs the production of its events of meaning, but it is still a logic whose play allows for variation, transformation, and even a skeptical reflexivity. In large part, of course, this play is only a consequence of the fact that the logic of instrumentalization is not given but has to be articulated and instituted so that at least potentially the drive to close the semantic circuit of the archive is always open at every point to resistance and contestation. Granting this, however, what may be in actuality more telling and significant is that the circuit is never finally able to secure itself so that the functioning of the archive is always both excessive and inadequate in relation to itself. The instrumentalized record is always simultaneously too big and too small for its discursive frame, saying less than is wished and more than is wanted. The cropping out of this excess and inadequacy in order to ensure that meaning falls squarely into place is the work of what I take to be a kind of violence that is brutal enough in its own ways. Yet it would clearly be wrong to suggest that the repression of the internal incoherence and final indeterminacy of archival systems is all that holds their remorseless effects of power knowledge in place. The collapse of police states and regimes of terror around the world in the past 20 years has certainly shown us this much in the context of a striking reversal. In the erstwhile German Democratic Republic, in post ceausescu Romania, in Argentina after the Dirty War, and in Cambodia after the fall of the Khmer Rouge, archives have been recovered from ransacked offices, waterlogged barns, prison camps, and garbage dumps, and with patient forensic archaeology and conservation, turned around so that they have begun to speak again. This time of the guilt of the interrogators, torturers, executioners, spies, and informers, for whom the pervasive archive was an infinitely elaborated map laid point by point on the world. A map that in a frightening reversal 
of another of Borges's fictional meditations, soaked up the fluid life of the world, leaving it desiccated, shriveled, tattered, and drained of blood. Even in the United States, secret stores of tapes, the files of hundreds of thousands of deleted emails, and more recently, of course, a cache of countless diplomatic cables, have emerged again as counter-archives of all that has been cynically kept from view, all that has been politically cleansed from the so-called public record, which in its official and media forms has become little more than a flickering shadow theater for the entrancement of the infantilized. Archives still retain, therefore, a particular and perhaps privileged relation to the field of truth. Yet this relationship is always framed by the larger machinery of governmentality that works in part, as Foucault has shown, by demarcating boundaries between the true and the false, and by bringing them to bear, not least on the differential relations to truth within which subjects are distinguished and defined. In the space of the archive, therefore, the politics of truth inevitably folds into a politics of identity through the regulation of relationships to time, truth, and memory, and to the practices and technologies of record and recollection. As a result, while the archive may once have seemed destined for invisibility in the anonymity of its functioning, the forces of self-determination, decolonization, and their counter-movements have made it a highly politicized space, as communities have come to be seen as being made and remade through the sharing of the ethical obligation of remembrance and through the claim to collective memory of which the archive is now seen as the repository. The very existence of an archive has come to be viewed as constitutive of a community's claim to identity. And what should be in the archive, who should adjudicate it, and who should have access to it, have become questions of urgent social and political significance. A striking example of this is Susan Micellus's extraordinary historical and pedagogical work in the divided territories of Kurdistan, aiming precisely, as she puts it, to build a collective memory with a people who have no national archive. Across the political field, therefore, the archive has become central to the political construction of community and identity just as memory studies have, since 1980, come to dominate academic engagements with photography, displacing the earlier concern with the politics of representation that marked the emergence of photo theory in the 1970s. What seems to be called for now, all the more so in the face of attempts by Google, Monsanto, and others to capitalize and dispossess the commons of knowledge, is not just an archaeology of the archive, but a counter-practice framed within another politics. And yet, there remains a danger in this, insofar as it conjures up a vision of the archive as a human right, just as it invites the thought to persist that truth is in the archive, even a counter-truth. What such a thought leaves intact is the intransigent function of the archive itself as a machinery of truth, a computer of everything that is the case. Each case, of course, duly recorded, documented, numbered, filed, and secreted away. For in the archive of everything, something can be the case only insofar as it is subject to the entire apparatus. But what? is an apparatus. The archival apparatus we are talking about is a composite machine, a kind of computer, in which, as we have seen, the camera with its less than efficient chemical coding system is hooked up to that other great 19th century invention, the upright file. So here we have it then, the one-eyed man 
and the one-armed man of Deleuze and Guattari, conjoining magical capture and legislative subjection as the axiomatic processes of a new information technology that rules the public and regulatory functions of the archive. But this already suggests that an apparatus is not just a matter of machinery. It is rather, as Michel Foucault stressed, a specific strategic knot of technologies, discourses, legislative frameworks, coercions, and enforcements that constitutes a network of practices and relations of power and that generates a positive field of knowledge. It is therefore at once a discursive machinery and a discursive economy, a circuitry whose mode of operation for Agamben, for Lacan, as well as for Deleuze and Guattari, is by capture. Capture is the name given to the plane of emergence of that third modality in Foucault's technology of power knowledge, the third modality, the subject, defined succinctly by Giorgio Agamben in his commentary on Foucault as the product of the conflictual relations between and among beings and apparatuses. Agamben, however, is also quick to point out that subjectification is not a singular process of concentration and condensation, but rather a process of multiplication and dissemination, enacted in third-stage capitalism as a process of non-identical accumulation. Now, almost, I'll steal two minutes of the audience's time to wrap this point up. So the whole process of subjectification is enacted, according to Agamben, rather as a process of multiplication and dissemination, enacted in third stage capitalism as a process of non-identical accumulation, now almost commonly embraced by its acolytes as the so-called openness of postmodern identity. Agamben prefers to say that the proliferation and accumulation of contemporary power has accelerated and multiplied the process of capture and subjectification to the point where identity is an interminable series of separations through which the apparatus instrumentalizes and in the same movement capitalizes being as subjection. There is then, Agamben insists, no question of redeeming this process by a civic vigilance aimed at using the apparatus correctly. Those who advocate this, Agamben says, are merely speaking for the apparatus that has always already captured them. Now it's a trenchant argument, and we might well heed Agamben's warning before proposing that the apparatus of the archive can be redeemed and rendered pure by a civic-minded watchfulness. The view we may derive from Agamben would seem to be like the one that Lenin once held about the state apparatus, at least before he seized power. The archive, too, cannot be taken over, but has to be smashed. Now, to say this here, under the shelter of the archive itself, may seem churlish and perverse. Yet the point of invoking Agamben's cautionary critique is to make us ask what we've lost of our being to archival machines. Just as nearer to home, it may also make us wary of what one might call the archival turn in scholarship over the past 10 or 15 years, by which I mean the turn to the archive as the ground of historical recovery and the starting point for scholarly research, grown weary of modernist historicism and of the kind of theory for which the historical text is at best only an allegory of its own modes of operation. We might contrast this with the equally recent discovery of the archive as itself an object of study. Indeed, for the history of photographies, an essential and inescapable object of study. Now, these two turns towards the archive are not at all the same kind of thing. For the one, the archive is not only given, but is the very frame of knowledge production itself. For the other, however, the archive has to be constituted as an object of knowledge whose workings are part of the historical and indeed part of the, histo the political problem. 
So here then is a very different sense in which, not least for histories of photographies, one might say that the archive must and must not be the horizon of our future thought. Thank you. Sorry to have kept you. for this um, tough discourse analysis of the archival regime, where uh, I, I have to say that I personally, I, I, I thought, who dares to say, <laughs> and I was positively puzzled, the truth is in the archive. After an age of postmodernism and deconstruction, I have not heard this such a strong statement, which you gave, uh, the truth is in the archive. Very strong statement. I didn't say that. I, I said that that's what the archive produces. And if you haven't heard it, then you haven't been down to the police station recently or the um, Immigration and Naturalization Service or you haven't been to the doctors or on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, quite clearly, it is only in arenas like this that uh, the, the truth is in the archive seems to be a, a deeply problematic statement, as indeed it is for me. Of course, yes. So please... Uh Yes, please. Thank you very much. This, you've, you've covered such a large spectrum of what Secular calls territory of images. And you've started with the domestic. And I'd like you to, if, if you could, uh, take us back to the domestic and perhaps comment on uh, what Adorno called the archive of one's own and maybe the archive uh, in the realm of the, the private rather than the, mm. the public, right? Is right. there anything that you, uh, I mean you that's, see? That's a very interesting point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Because what I was stressing in the domestic space is yes. that that space too is saturated by this archival machinery. And of mm -hmm. course, the personal collection of stereographic cards was marketed was already framed by the catalog, by the categories. So the selling of this set, and of course that's what largely structures the organization of our entertainment today. And that's what makes, um, in the States, there's currently a big argument about who takes the um, living room. Is it going to be Apple or Microsoft? But I think the other side of that that I didn't bring out is what you're gesturing towards, which is the resistance to that, which um, in which that archival machinery that is prescripted is directed towards other kinds of discovery and, and connection and recollection. And, and indeed, I, I accept that point, it's an important one. Thank you so much for this fascinating paper. Um, th at the beginning, when you were still uh, talking about Bertillon and, and other early photographic archivists, um, you sort of held out the promise that uh, that in your paper you were going to speak not about the archive as simply a form of accumulation, which is the traditional way of talking about it, but that there was something that went beyond accumulation. I think you quoted Sikula as saying that the archive uh, is... No, Sikula said it was about volume primarily, and, and you said that that was not enough and that one needed to go beyond that. Now, and this is also in relation to this idea uh, of the truth of the archive. I mean, couldn't one say that the problem of the archive is really not its volume, but, but access? I mean, the problem with the archive is always, and this also concerns, I think, importantly, uh, the question of its truth. I mean, the archive can only be as true as you're able to access it. And the problem that Bertillon and others had was not so much how to organize the mass of objects that they had, created, but how to gain access to them. So, so I wonder if that's something that needs to be mentioned in this, con in this uh, context. Well, access is clearly uh, important. It's part of the current um, politics of the archive. But I also wanted to bring out the point which indeed you made, that entropy isn't just something that enters the archive from the outside. I think this is how you opened your paper. But entropy is a constitutive function of the archive. Indeed, what I was arguing is that this machinery, which is not just a question of this sh machinery being accessible, because that would open up the argument that a politics of the archive should be a politics of access, which would leave untouched 
the machinery, the apparatus of truth. And what I was also trying to bring out was the character of that apparatus, which for Foucault is a disciplinary apparatus. But one might also say that in the workings of, the, of that apparatus, it is never able to secure its own effects because the archival image doesn't generate its evidential effect in and of itself by its indexicality. It belongs to the network of um, equivalences and substitutions that make up the archival system. And that network of differences cannot be closed. So it is in itself haunted by its incompleteness, which to me is what drives the violence of the archive. I don't mean the violence with which the archive is policed, but the violence, the constitutive violence of the archive itself as a formation of knowledge. And both of those violences have to be attended to by any politics of the archive. Did, did that get somewhere? Okay. okay, there's time for one more question before we will have a very short 10 minute coffee break. Okay, um, I have one question. Um, <laughs> uh, because you seem to have, um, to have suggested that this renewed interest in archives has to do with decolonization and maybe with the post-89 moment uh, here in, in, in um, the, the deconstruction of the division be between East and West, so to say. Yeah, sorry. And uh, I would like to, to elaborate on this a little bit maybe because it is, it is very interesting. On the one hand, it seems that those archives have been recuperated or reused or um, turned over, as you said. On the other hand, they, uh, in, in many places, they have become a, a new source of, um, uh, of violence, actually, mm. because they have not been um, um, uh, critically um, yes. Um, um, assessed and I don't know thought through, but they have been used as 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 machineries of truth exactly. So um, archives that that were used to repress and um, um, and affect violence upon people then were used as sources of truth about about that uh, about that time. And so the one related question would be, uh, w what do you think about the showing of those Cambodia pictures uh, at the MoMA? Yes. Because there was also a huge uh, debate about that. Yes. Um, I mean, a couple of points there. Um, uh, certainly then, the question of the turning of the archive, then uh, it's, it's the classic question of deconstruction, that inversion is not enough. If an inversion does not go with an undoing from within, so merely turning around the archive, as has happened in Argentina, in Cambodia, in the former GDR, um, is not enough and it will generate its own effects of terror. Um, so I certainly agree with you on that. Um, on the question of the renewed interest in archives, what are the, the renewed interest that troubles me is that that's now saturating the uh, curatorial language of museums, which has come out of that um, essay by Hal Foster, which is not really to blame for the way it has been taken up on the archival mode, in which we're now um, offered, as in the Guggenheim exhibition, Haunted, um, a view of the artwork as archive. And what I was troubled about with that is the sapping of any kind of uh, 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 question of power and the politics of the archive and its absorption into this vapid and inert curatorial language that now is spread right across um, uh, the cosmopolitan transnational museum world. Sorry to the curators. Um, thank you, pardon. You can have a go at scholars later on. Um, our chiefing is uh, gathering um, um, piece of papers, putting them in files organizing them in this machinery you, you describe. And it's the same operation with written archives and photographic archives. But uh, the difference maybe is in the cataloging of these uh, two sort of papers, papers with images and papers with words. And don't you think that um, there is something to 
um, to state about this uh, regarding with the access of these papers with the description of the uh, of what you you find inside the files if they are written papers or images as photographic images um. I think I'm still too stuck in the 70s to accept that distinction between the, file, between the filing of words and the filing of pictures. After all, how are the pictures filed other than through a verbal matrix in which then those images are already saturated and read and scripted by the verbal uh, uh, definers? And indeed, um, uh, so we would have to think not about filing by words, filing by images, but of this intertextual machine which is, of course, also a physical machine, since until the invention of the, of the modern vertical file in 1892, you didn't even have the machineries for organizing them. So I'd be, um, uh, the way I would think about it would be of the inseparable imbrication of word, image, and uh, machinery that, in their convergence, make the apparatus. Does that, does, okay.